Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Stephen Mercer. I'm an independent educational consultant. I help students and families find great colleges to apply to. And I'm also an adjunct professor in the online college counseling certificate program at University of California, San Diego. And I'm really, really happy to welcome back a guest that we had on previously and a, a colleague that I've known for a long time, Adam Ingersoll, who's the co-founder of Compass Education Group, a real expert with deep, deep knowledge and experience in the world of college admission, but in particular standardized testing. So Adam, welcome, really happy to have you here. Thank you, Stephen, it's great to be with you again. So I often tell students and families that I work with that policies and um, procedures and standards in the world of college admission don't change very fast, that things move slowly, but I'm wrong in this regard because over the last 12 months, you know, all throughout the year 2020, and now into the very beginning of 2021, there's been some really brisk change in the world of college admission, in particular around standardized testing. And that's why I, I wanted to have you back to tell us a bit about that. Sure. So why don't you fill us in? You know, we've seen really recent, in the very, very beginning, the first month of 2021, some real sea change in college admission testing. So tell us what's going on. Uh, the big news is College Board did some portfolio rebalancing. They killed off a couple of their underperforming assets. I'm kind of intentionally using business speak to uh, make fun of College Board's notional nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. uh, so the SAT essay, and I think much more importantly, the SAT subject tests are being phased out. Uh, the subject tests immediately will not be offered again in, in the U.S. Two final administrations in May and June inter internationally, uh, but they're, they're done. And the essay uh, has to stick around a bit longer. It's available to students who, for some reason, want to take it through June. After that, it will only be available through college boards, uh, school district or state contracts that still require it. But um, yeah, we've the official word, the, the, the spin from the college board is that they are kind of decluttering the playing field for students and trying to streamline the process for everyone, make things easier. But in reality, uh, there was no longer a business case for either of these products even before the pandemic. And yeah. with the hit that College Board is taking to one of its core products, the SAT and ACT, and, and the related cost-cutting measures they have to take, it made no sense to keep around what had really become a niche product of uh, uh, the subject test. All right, so let's let's peel that onion a little bit more. Because um, I really appreciate your perspective and in, in how you... I think you know a lot more about what's going on behind the scenes than most counselors like me, right? And I'll just say from a counseling point of view, to, for the vast majority of students that I work with, to have subject tests and the SAT essay section go away is really a, a, a great thing, right? It's just a, a less complication. For most students, it's less stress. There are definitely some students that it's, um, it's a missed opportunity because they test really well and they can show their strengths. But for most students, I'd say that, that's just lovely, right? And most students uh, so far have been pretty happy about that. But there's another side of it, which you've touched on, which is more of the kind of looking through this through the college board as a very large organization and being that they have been quite mindful of the, the cost, the business side of this, whether it's viable, right? That it's not just simply a, an educational decision. Tell us more about that. Maybe like historically, what, what do you think led to that? When does, when did the, was there a downfall that you could look back in time and say when this started to really be, become a real possibility or, you know, what do you think? Absolutely. I'm, I don't know if I can say this on UC TV, but it's the UC's fault. Uh, when the UC, U, UC has driven college board policy to a large extent for years. Uh, the Why SA though? Why do you think that is? Uh, the SAT would not be what it is today had the UCs not started requiring it, I believe, in the 1960s. That was a huge uh, event for the College Board when their kind of East Coast private school um, enterprise really became national with the, with the UCs requiring it. The subject tests, um, once upon a time, 20 years ago, the, the UC president at, uh, at the time, Richard Atkinson, actually made the case that the subject tests were of more value to, value to the UC than the SAT. So subject tests have not always been this, you know, unloved uh, stepchild. They, they've had their, their moment. Uh, but when the UC decided to uh, stop requiring subject tests, I think this was, this was 15 years ago, 
that put the, the, the subject test on a death march. And it was then at that point, it was a matter of when, not if they would be killed off. Um, yeah, the, the, the UC system just absolutely dwarfed um, the, other, the other schools that, uh, that cared at all. But it was hard politically for the College Board to kill them off for these reasons. The subject tests are popular internationally, hmm. where uh, students applying to U.S. colleges want to show that uh, their abilities are on par with U.S. students. There was also some appeal or usefulness for the subject test in the other direction, kids applying hmm. to U.K. schools in particular. And then a niche that is really often just overlooked and mistreated with testing policy is uh, the, the students who are homeschooled. Right. They found the subject test very useful because they're one hour exams, not tied explicitly to you know, AP curricula, uh, more accessible, anyone could sign up and go and take them, whereas APs are much more locked down and more difficult. Uh, right. So it's, it's just, it really, I think, ironic. I don't think this is intentional, uh, but it was a leader in the California homeschool community who was behind in part the lawsuits last fall that led to the UC going test-free. Uh, the argument was that homeschooled kids, especially those with learning differences, couldn't possibly um, take the tests during a pandemic. And that, that's actually why you, the, you, the SAT uh, is now not used at all by UC. So I don't think that the college board is trying to get back at that at that community, but that is, I think, of the various constituents that remained for the subject tests, that's the group that is most disappointed or that uh, is most lacking an alternative to demonstrate similar uh, uh, skills. Yeah, well, that's a, a future topic for this show. Stephen, the, the parallel track here with subject tests is they, they existed, uh, they're as old as the SAT. They're more than 100 years old. Originally, they were the boards, and then they were achievement tests, and the name keeps changing, but there's, they've always, always existed. Um, in re more recent years, the differentiation between subject tests and APs had gotten blurred. As the AP program became so wildly successful, millions of kids taking, um, or millions of AP exams being taken every year, the original argument or distinction between the two, AP, advanced placement for college credit, subject tests, more lightweight for admission decisions. That had kind of, kind of blurred. And the AP program was, is so ubiquitous now that um, the need for the subject tests and the popularity of the subject tests had really, uh, really waned. So right. College Board did what they had to do. And I think they're using COVID partially as, as a, as a you know, reasonable rationale. Well, so let's talk about that fallout. You know, you started to touch on the AP and exams and the AP program in general, which is more than just the exams, obviously, for the College Board. Um, it's another major kind of, if we're going to look at through a, the business lens, the AP program is another major source of income and a line of business for the College Board, right? I know that, again, strikes a cynical tone, but it's real, it's a real com serious component of that organization and it's been growing, right? So to me, again, the cynical side of me thinks this is just really also a play to make the AP even bigger for them. It's a huge part of their business. And from their point of view, where they would bristle at our cynicism is they would argue that the program is nothing but holy and good in, in the opportunities it provides to students and the way it, it promotes rigor across the country, you know, so they, they would they would take issue with our premise that having a billion dollar nonprofit with such deep tentacles in our schools is is bad. <laughs> right. They don't see themselves that that way. Um, but it's a huge product. And I would I would I would note that it's a more durable product, meaning that unlike the SAT, which we have seen this organized opposition against going back decades, the test optional movement. Uh, and unlike uh, and the the uh, sorry the SAT is tied also to one of their really juicy high margin revenue lines, which is selling students names to, and information to colleges. The AP program is deeply integrated within our school systems. Right. It is not just reviled. It's it's interesting. College counselors, uh, as a group, generally uh, are not fans of the SAT. 
and the way it's run and so forth. The public school system, you would find, you know, tens of thousands of vocal defenders of AP, teachers who like being AP teachers and who feel pretty well supported by the college board. Um, I think the college board has done a good job developing uh, the AP program. So there's no organized opposition to the AP program. Um, And what better evidence of that than 10 months ago, at the height of the first wave of the pandemic, APs could not be safely administered at schools. College board overnight decided to let kids take a much shorter version of an AP at home on the computer. And that was that was crazy. And there were some issues, some problems with it. But the entire higher education world basically just, you know, shrugged that off and just went ahead with it, which speaks to, I think, the stature, the clout that the AP program has. So from that perspective, it makes all the sense in the world for the college board to double down and inject more resources into AP uh, when the future of the SAT, I, I think rumors of its imminent demise are overstated, but I'd much rather right now at College Board, I'd rather be Trevor Packer, you know, the VP of the AP program than whoever it is who's running the SAT program. And I bet a lot of your audience, they recognize the name Trevor Packer. He's been at that helm for years. I couldn't tell you who right now is officially the the, the Trevor of SAT. That's, that's a revolving door. So I, think, I think all that's telling as you try to get a sense okay. of the College Board's intentions and, and future. All right. So let me ask you this. Immediately upon the news, you know, being sent out, I I work with a whole variety of students and families. A lot of them pay a lot of attention to what's going on in college admission because they're uh, interested. Some are anxious. And I got an email right away from a parent who said, so what does this mean that my student can't take the subject test as planned? Do I need to um, switch gears and have them study only for AP exams and in fact take more AP exams because obviously that's going to be the, uh, what's going to fill the gap. What, what would you say to that? We're in a parallel universe. I, I spent a lot of time talking to not just independent counselors, but also school counselors. And I, I, I found, I, I had confirmed a week in advance that the subject tests were going to be, be gone. So I was in touch with school counselors, especially those who I, for whom I knew this was probably going to be problematic. And here's an anecdote. Uh, very well-known, incredibly competitive, you know, independent school, private school, in the process of phasing out a- the AP, as many you know, um, private schools have done, it was a O oh blank moment for them. And they had, it's, and here's how these dots connect. It's irrational, but it's, it's the world we live in. This school, the perception internally was that they had had a tough round, you know, Harvard uh, restricted early action and some, a few other places. And they're not used to having a tough round, you know, uh, and of course, uh, a few parents who were also board members were already before I, before uh, I, I broke this news, were already wondering if it was a mistake to phase out APs and then had that weakened their their students. So this school, and I think they're they're an outlier, but this school immediately knew they were going to have to do something different in response to subject tests being canceled because subject hmm. tests were giving them kind of cover to say, well, Okay, if you still think it's bad that we're dropping AP, then just take subject tests. Be quiet. Go go take your subject tests. Oh. And now they they had I think a, a, a emergency meeting overnight and quickly decided that they are going to have to do two basically two things: create opportunities logistically for their kids to take AP exams, and that may mean partnering with a local public school, renting space at a local community college, even. Uh, number number two, they were going to have to go to their faculty, some of whom were going to be furious and say, you got to bleed back in some AP stuff to make kids feel like we're giving them more support for this. So it's a classic case of, of the college board tail wagging the entire you know school system dog. Yeah. And again, I think they're an outlier. Uh, but Subject test, what was always fascinating was there's this disconnect in the last five years between the tiny number of colleges that still required or recommended subject tests. It was approaching right. zero, but several hundred thousand kids still took subject tests. Like it only takes a few, Georgetown, to say we'd like to receive AP scores from applicants. 
you know, and then suddenly that right. then drives the herd uh, uh, behavior. Uh, so <clears throat> that energy, so there was still more energy put into subject tests than college policy officially justified. That right. energy will not just dissipate into thin air. It's right. going to try to find some other academic outlet, some option, some ability to try to differentiate. Um, and AP would be the most logical target for that energy. Right. Whether it is taking AP classes you would not otherwise have taken, taking AP exams even though you're not in the class, or what I think is maybe the most troubling reaction we might see would be kids thinking, I now need to take APs in younger grades. Because right. if they're more relevant for college, I need them to show up on you know 10th and 11th grade. Right. So sorry for the long answer, but the the the, the dominoes here are are interesting. Well, and you mentioned you know this anecdote about this school, and you said maybe it's an outlier, but I'm not. I don't. I don't suggest that it's it's probably going to be common, but I I don't probably it's probably not that much of an outlier. That, that's my concern. If I'm wrong, great, and it settles a little bit more calmly at most schools or districts, that's great. But I'm I'm worried that it's this kind of exactly this type of thing that you're talking about. One of my kind of issues that I always think a lot about, and it's a little bit contradictory because I, like a lot of counselors, as you mentioned, I don't love standardized tests for my students, right? It, it generally causes more anxiety and stress and complication in the process and less time on thinking about good education and fit and all these, all these things that we, we wanna talk about as counselors and we wanna focus on in the transition from high school to college. However, what I appreciate about the standardized test is that it adds some transparency to the process, right? I know that at highly selective schools or at more modestly selective schools, we don't ever know exactly why someone gets admitted or denied. But knowing that there's some objective objective criteria, in addition to just a GPA and, say, number of AP or honors or IB classes that a student takes, but as well as a standardized exam of some sort, helps everyone to understand you are competitive, you're not competitive. There's, where's that gray area? And I'm, I'm really worried about the lack of transparency that this is going to um, uh, create as admission decisions come out this year, perhaps next. We'll see. You're touching on something really important. I, it's, I think two, two comments. It's hard for colleges in this environment, I think, sometimes to be as transparent as they would like. I think they are worried about couching a policy in language that appears elitist or exclusive even when, at least in their own mind, they truly don't intend it to be, and then they're excoriated in the court of, of, of public opinion. So I, th I think colleges are, are nervous and very careful, and it makes them awkward in how they talk about tests. It actually works against transparency because they're very reluctant to say something that would be un unpopular. The second thing is I think we, we mostly think about testing behavior as being driven top down by college policy. I think sometimes we understate the extent to which it is driven by the kids and more specifically, their parents. And <clears throat> the parents, these families, many of them want objectivity or at least perception of it. And they want the ability to differentiate. So there are kids you know, who are saying, hey, I know that in my AP classes, half of us are gonna get A's, but only about 10 to 10% 10 of us could get fives and another 20% could get fours. I'm one of those, you know? So I, I, would, I value a college that's willing right. to uh, give me some credit of some kind for uh, the, the actual standardized test score. Right. So I think, college, I think colleges are gonna have a harder time making the case that AP ex, uh, classes and AP exams aren't, they're not, that, that, that they're not keeping score with those, the way they've mm. tried to really argue, especially the last year, that they're truly test optional. It's one thing to make the case that SCT, ACT, those tests have been well known to be problematic for decades. They're truly just optional for us. You know, that, okay. Saying that an AP exam score or even an a, a class, that that is also something on which we're, oh, just optional. Or even I'm in a conversation right now, Stephen, online with college counselors arguing that AP uh, colleges should go AP score blind. Interesting. It is interesting, but it's yeah. also going to Let's be see. a head scratcher to a lot of people thinking, wait a second. So 
a five versus a one, um, you don't care to know that you'll redact that. That's that's irrelevant. Okay. I think I think there, yeah. we're at risk of overreacting and just making things that much more confusing for families working against the transparency that I think you very correctly try to hold up is like, this should be a priority is, is more transparency. Right. And I think the problem with, if there's more, if, if colleges and college board and families and students are going to lean into the AP program more, if that's just inevitable, let's say, then I'm worried that there's a confusion between an AP class, which is really about rigor, that's kind of, it checks that box in the college application. Whereas a test score, an AP exam score, isn't about taking a rigorous course load. It's a different language. It's it's a standardized test result, which has its own place. It checks a different box in the list of considerations that colleges look at. So I think there's confusion there as to what, if a student is trying to choose to double down on more AP, what does that really mean? Are they doubling down on taking more classes? Are they really worried about the tests? Or is it just both and that's it? It could be all of the above. And I think an interesting uh, bridge between the two things you just mentioned. You said AP classes demonstrate rigor. AP exam, standardized test score. In between that, of course, is your grade in the AP class. Right. The argument is that the score helps substantiate your grade. Or for some kids, it works the other way. I got off to a slow start and I, I ultimately scrambled up back up to a B in the AP class, but I knew my stuff by the end of the year and I can get a five. It, that can't even help me, really? So th this I think is going to be just uh, much more confusing to students than the idea that the SAT, ACT is, you know, because kids take especially the kids applying you know, to, to selective colleges, who a lot of the you know, independent counselors are advising and working with. Those kids kind of know when they take the SAT and ACT that this is basically kind of lower level academic stuff. This is not that academic challenging. Um, being good at this shouldn't make me stand out. I'm, I'm good at math up through algebra two, and I can do reading passages and grammar. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's there's more of an assumption of relevance or prestige or whatever with fives in a year long you know class that used to mean college credit. <laughs> How yeah, can you claim right. that a class that a program designed to give college credit that the scores that determine whether you get that credit uh, don't don't signify something potentially important? It's just a confusing uh, case yeah. to make to students. I agree. I agree. So Adam, in your view, what are some other things on the horizon around, I know the pandemic is still causing waves of uncertainty, uh, this, all these changes, but what about the administration of AP exams coming up? What about things like online testing? Is that, you know, what's coming online? What do you see happening? Um, let's take um, online testing, SAT, ACT first. That is continuing to be really washed out in many parts of the country, particularly the, uh, the West Coast. Hmm. Um, so I think college board and ACT for the most part are hunkering down and hoping that in the admission cycle in the fall, testing availability returns to something near normal and kids who are currently 11th graders can get through it if they want it. And availability of SCT, ACT, there's time for it to resolve. Uh, they have in their back pocket, ACT especially, an online testing option ready to go. ACT hmm. is, as we speak this month, uh, doing large beta testing of students taking the ACT uh, fully online, hmm. at home, uh, remote proctoring for, for security. And it's going fine. Um, they, they also might consider uh, later this spring, if late spring test dates get wiped out, offering to the students in the most affected areas the option to take their, the online ACT instead. So as a product, they have that fully ready to go and they're just trying to kind of find the right time uh, where it'll be tolerated by the admissions community. College Board is not as far along, but College Board committed in a, in a press release a week ago to uh, a computer adaptive test within a couple of years. Hmm. For those of you who have taken a, a graduate level test other than the MCAT in the last 10, 20 years, 
You know, a computer adaptive test is one where the difficulty of the questions, the mix of questions coming at you is dynamic. So the better you do, the more hard questions you get, basically, kind of pegs your ability more efficiently and more precisely, theoretically. So that stuff is, is coming, but it's not of immediate concern, I think, to 11th graders, something to keep an eye on. The, the problem, I think, with administration and availability is going to be with the APs coming up in just a couple of months. So College Board has been clear that they believe AP exams really ideally should be administered at school in their full format. College Board has also said that they are not this year going to, again, do a shortened mini AP. Uh, it's going to be the full format only. Right mm -hmm. now, College Board is saying that they will offer an at-home option, but it's only going to be uh, clearly based on necessity. You got to kind of okay. prove it. The school will have to have to to approve it. And I, I think they are for now just kind of being overly optimistic that schools will be able to. I mean, what do you think are the odds that schools be able to fully administer APs in California this year? Really just um, February, March, April, three and a half months away. I hope so. I, I think maybe a smattering, but but overall, no. So I, I think there's going to be enough. a bit of chaos around AP administration this spring with College Board having to, in a rush, allow more kids than they hoped to take it at home. And there will be some uh, issues, uh, some security concerns. But I think everybody will say this is the last time. It'll all be back to normal by 2022. And the world will, will right. move forward. Okay. And I, I actually agree with that. I think we're probably getting over the, the hump of these difficulties and hopefully we will be back to normal and we can just worry about the regular things, right? Well, Adam, I can't thank you enough. You always, every time I speak with you, the your knowledge, your insight, um, what, what, you, what you share is just so helpful and so remarkable. And I know everyone um, has uh, really benefited from hearing from you today. So thanks so much. I hope to have you back. Always glad to. Good to see you again. All right, take care. Take care, everyone.